I am exercising economy. <laughs> <laughs> By buying lots of books at a used book sale? Yeah. Welcome to Charlotte Mason Says. I'm John Schindel, here with my wife, Crystal. Join us as we read and discuss the home education series. Okay, so we're looking at chapter 25, which is only one chapter away from the end of the book. We're not excited. <laughs> We've only been talking about it for the last two months <laughs> that we're so close to the end. Oh, but we're so close. We're so close. <laughs> So close. We're only going to have two more discussions and then we will have read through and discussed this entire book, cover to cover, front to back. We were looking at our books the other day and there's definitely a thumbprint of smudging dirt on the... It's like the yellowed oil discoloration of fingered... In, in the middle of the page on the opposite side of the binding. We can tell which is mine and which is his because I take mine more places, so it's a little bit more beat up. Yeah, I pick mine up and read it about once a week. That's all I do. <laughs> but pretty soon we're going to put these books down and not pick them up again for a while. That means we need to order my next book. We do. We're going to do Home Education. Volume 1. Volume 1. And in January, we're going to do a giveaway. We are. That's right. I forgot. Brand new first giveaway of home education. Or if you already have it, Anthony at Living Book Press has graciously offered this comparable money value to there get another go. book at his store. So we're going to be running some ads on our social media platforms as well as talking about it here for the next uh three episodes because we only have three more until we're done with this book that uh the one of the primary ways we're going to go about doing this is to have you sign up for our new email mailing list and now this is very important the email mailing list because as as people are people as corporations are getting more and more uh greedy or money hungry or sensorial or whatever chances of us losing access to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or anything else that's out there. And so the strongest way that we have to get a hold of you, our dear listeners, is for you to become a part of our mailing list. And this mailing list will, uh, from this mailing list, we can shoot out episode updates we could, if we wanted to, write a weekly blog or something like that, although chances are good that's never going to happen. I have it set up right now to where there's two ways you can sign up. You can sign up, well, I guess technically three. You can sign up for just the updates when we have an episode. You can sign up for the newsletter. Or you can sign up for both. I think that's how I have it set up. <laughs> I think I think that's right. So the plan is we're going to get through... Volume two over the next three episodes. So we've got this discussion, a reading, and then the, the last and final discussion. And we might do a wrap up discussion or something, an intermediary episode or something. We could do how the things we have learned and parents and children relate to the principles. We could. That would actually be interesting. Because one of the things we keep talking about is how how we're glad that we've started in this book because it gave us a good feel for her philosophy. And even without me knowing exactly what her method is, knowing her philosophy allows me to live my life with my children and my family in such a way as to nurture that environment of learning. Mm -hmm. And I now know why we do the things we do. I was talking with my brother the other day and I, he was over here, uh, Crystal was gone for a weekend, and so he hung out. He normally comes out on Saturday, Sunday afternoons, and then I drive him home Sunday evening, but Crystal wasn't here, so I had to, he, he stayed over the night, which meant he was here for breakfast. And at breakfast, we do some stuff in the morning, and one of the things I did was read a poem. 
And he kind of chuckled at me like, hi, you read a poem. I don't understand. And so we got, he and I got to talk about why we read poetry. And I could actually say, well, this is why we read poetry. It's so that we can inspire ideas in our children. I wouldn't have been able to do that had I not read through this book. Mm -hmm. So just the mere fact that I've, that, that we've studied this, I didn't have to pull out the book. I didn't have to call you. You didn't have to say, I do it because my wife told me to. And that's at the, at the end of me telling him why I'm doing it. I looked at him and went, wow, I actually know this. (laughs) I, I don't have to say, well, I just do it because Crystal tells me to. So I don't know. It's it, even without knowing the method, me knowing the uh, the reason behind the method has helped tremendously. So I should save that for the recap. Session. I probably should, <laughs> or or that'll be a taste of what's coming up in the recap session. But having said that, I'm very excited to move on to book one to learn what her actual method is. So we've got a couple episodes, and we'll be done with this book. We'll do at least one intermediary episode and then we'll be diving into book one come january which means there will be a couple week break there will be happy we, advent yeah happy advent we're very excited for a break to, to come up we've been we've been we've been doing this once a week for a year now we- november 21 is our official was our first episode release date it was and I was looking at it earlier. The first reading of the preface was released on November 25th. The last reading of the last chapter will be released on November 25th. Nice. So, totally unplanned. No, we totally planned it that way. But We looked at the calendar us, and we decided. took us one year to read and get through it all. And then there will be one more discussion. But Right. So I know we've said it before, but thank you to everyone who's continuing to listen, everyone who started with us, who randomly found us even before we posted anything to social media. That was one of the things that that made us chuckle is we posted the episode and people started downloading it. I think we had 50 downloads before we did anything. Before we did anything, we had downloads. It was weird. So if you're one of those original people that downloaded it, that found us even before we got on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever, then kudos to you for hanging out and sticking around. If if you've just joined us in the last couple of episodes, then kudos to you for finding us. Go back and listen to some of the other episodes. I'm sure you'll find all kinds of fun stuff, or at least you'll get to laugh at us. That's true. Or something. I laugh at John. I laugh at myself too. You don't laugh at me? I would never laugh at you. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe sometimes. Only all the time. (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) So having said all of that. You'll find something in there. Right. Having gotten the housekeeping out of the way, let's actually dive into this chapter, chapter 25. So this chapter is the great recognition required of parents. And she starts out talking about a painting. A mural? Fresco. A fresco. It's a fresco? It's a fresco. From the 1400s. 14th century. Mosaic. I was thinking mosaic. It's not a mosaic. Mosaic is all the little tiles. This is... It was painted. (laughs) It's a giant painting on a wall. I was about... And a ceiling. And a ceiling. I was about to be very, very impressed with this. Now I'm only very impressed. It's in Florence, Italy, in the Spanish chapel attached to the Church of Santa Maria Novella. And Mr. Ruskin wrote a book about it. He did. And if you are at all interested in diving into this painting and what it means. Lots of other people have done that. Lots and lots of people. Uh, There was, who was it the... An Ambleside Online lady who you said you said someone spent months studying this book and then gave a speech about it. That was Brandy Vensel. Mm-hmm. She she is a part of Ambleside Online. Ambleside, I feel good about that. And then Nicole Handfield compiled a book 
like a printed book you can hold in your hand all about it, as well as had some professional paintings done. And you can buy a print of that from Riverbend Press. All of these I did actually put in the show notes. I realize I've said that many times and things haven't made it to the show notes, but this time I put them in already. Ooh, they're preemptively <laughs> they're, in the show notes. They're already in there. Nice. So there is a ton of information out there about this actual fresco and how it relates and all of that stuff. Suffice to say, John and I didn't really feel like going into it <laughs> very no, much. we kind of skipped over it a little bit. Although I did read that she had her own great recognition before going and seeing this this fresco. Okay. She actually did go and see it, and it did inspire her. But she had this recognition already. The great recognition is that God, the Holy Spirit, is himself personally the imparter of knowledge, the instructor of youth, the inspirer of genius. So that is the great recognition. And she understood that before seeing this fresco. Okay. Based okay. on research that Charlotte Mason Poetry has done, Art Middlecoff's website, they've they've timelined when she wrote, when she visited, and when she did things. And so she had written about it before she went to see it. Gotcha. So. Interesting. Okay. So she already had that concept in mind. Maybe she had pre-read this book and then went and see, saw it. You know, that wouldn't surprise me if she got a hold of Mr. Ruskin's book. So we're pretty much going to skip over the first three pages of this chapter. What, what it is, is you have the Holy Ghost, the disciples, then the apostles, and then virtues, faith, hope, and love, and then the cardinal virtues, and then the sciences. And where she's going to go is, you know, with why on earth are the sciences right here, right next to the apostles and theology? Which is a good question. But that's the question that she's going to answer throughout the first half of this book. Chapter. Throughout the first half of this chapter, she's going to ask the question, or she's going to answer the question, why? Why is it this way? Mm -hmm. And in the second half of this chapter, much like the last one, so what do we do about it? Mm -hmm. So again, an imperative and an interrogative? Indicatives and imperatives. The indicative is the why, the imperative is the what. So we're going to go over the the indicative. Why? Why is this the way things are? And then what do we do based on this knowledge? Mm -hmm. So she first, I mean, after, after she explains what the painting is, she talks about Ruskin. She talks about the painting, the fresco mural, whatever. She comes to the end of those sections and she says, let us glance for a moment at the conception of education in our own century. So she said, in the first place, we divide education into religious and secular. So we, we put a dividing line in. If it's education, it's, it's secular. If it's religious, it's religious. And ne'er the twain shall meet. Which we also talked about in chapter 13, the divide between the religious and the secular. Right. And she says, uh, the more devout among us insist upon religious education as well as sexual, secular. Many of us are content to do without religious education altogether. We're satisfied with what we with we're satisfied with what we not only call secular, but make secular in the sense that we understand the word. So so we're we're apt to just get rid of the religious altogether. And just focus on facts and things and try and get God out of the picture. Mm -hmm. And some Christians rise a little higher. You know, even grammar and arithmetic may in some not very clear way be used for God. So, yes, you need that. You can use it for God. She's saying, no, the great recognition is that God, the Holy Spirit, is himself personally the imparter of knowledge, the instructor of youth 
the inspirer of genius. And so, like this fresco has, it has the virtues, not necessarily right alongside, but in the exact same area as geometry, geography, mm -hmm. math, grammar, logic. They're right. all essentially on the same plane. They're all in the same place. Right. They're, they're all on a hierarchy from the Holy Spirit down. Mm -hmm. And they're all they're all interconnected and they're all linked. And she says that the the Florentine mind of the Middle Ages went even further, and that it's n not only were they under the direct outpouring the seven liberal arts were of the Holy Ghost, but that every fruitful idea, every original conception, even from those who are pagans, and she says, you know, uh, all of the figures in this picture are pagans yeah where we we don't see that they acknowledge or claim to be christian but that they are also inspired by the holy spirit mm -hmm. no i like where she goes next with this she says but we must not accept even an inspiring idea blindly so even this she she just she ran over this painting. She ran over what this guy's idea was. She went through what what she believes is true about that. And then she says, but hold on, knowing what we know about ideas and knowing what we know about how they can lead us down paths that are not true and not correct, we have got to, we have to make sure that this idea came from the right place and it is a true thing. Mm-hmm. So I, I appreciated that. She didn't just take this as fact. She didn't just look at this and be like, oh, yeah, that's the way it should be. That is the way it should be. She she looked at it. She was inspired by it. And then she stopped and she stepped back and she she had a critical look at it to determine whether it fits or not, whether it's true or not. Mm -hmm. And so as she goes into this, she says, uh, let's see, Plato hints at such thought in his contention that knowledge and virtue are fundamentally identical and that if virtue be divine in its origin, so must knowledge be also. So Plato had this idea that knowledge and virtue were one and the same and that it had it's from its divine in origin. And then she goes back to ancient Egypt as well, where she says, uh, Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the spirit of God is? Practical discernment and knowledge of everyday matters and of how to deal with emergencies were not held by this king of Egypt to be the teachings unworthy of the Spirit of God. To back up a little bit to give context to that one, that is after Joseph, who is who has been a slave in Egypt, interpreted Pharaoh's dreams and told him there will be seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. Here's a great idea store up for the years of years of famine and pharaoh said well can we find somebody who can do this who can practically discern mm. everyday matters deal with emergencies so it wasn't that he was like oh yeah the spirit of god told you this it was someone need the spirit of god needs to move somebody to be able to do these practical things because no one else could tell him his dream well and then someone more told him that. his dream and gave him a good plan with how to deal with it and so he was able to put divine, you were told the dream, and mundane, you know what to do about it in the same basket mm -hmm. of still divinely inspired, one one of a divine nature and the other of a of a non divine nature. Mundane. Practical? Practical. Mundane, practical. Practical discernment. Everyday matters. That's what she says. That's why I said it. <laughs> so this idea goes back goes back so far they even talk she she brings up then uh saul and and david um and then the example of david giving solomon the plans for the temple that had been received from god right so in addition to the practical where we see joseph the ruling where we see in saul we see the beauty and the construction in david mm-hmm and Solomon. 
Yeah, and she says, so science, art, poetry, we can we can pretty well say that yeah, those those are from the spirit. They're they're high, they're they're beautiful. But she says it sometimes occurs to one to wonder who invented in the first place the way of using the most elemental necessities of life. Who first discovered the means of producing fire or joining wood or smelting ores or sowing seed of grinding corn? Or making rhubarb pie. Or making rhubarb pie. or Which apparently rhubarb is poisonous. It is. But some of it's not. So who was the guinea pig for that? <laughs> <laughs> right? The, the person who's like, oh, this thing kills you, but let me try it this way and see if it kills you also. <laughs> like, come on. You find out as a, as a kid, you find out that the little red berries that, that grow on most trees, they're poisonous. So what do you do? You stay away from them. <laughs> you don't be like, huh, it was poisonous when I ate it. I wonder if I eat it this way, if it'll still be poisonous. <laughs> Gosh. So, yes, that I do actually wonder that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. No, but it, it makes sense. It's a, it goes along with the same question she's asking, though. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, – you talk to uh, environmental scientists and they talk about the – not environmental, evolutionary scientists. Sorry, I almost went really weird there. Um, <laughs> they talk about the history of the early man where – where man evolved from a monkey and then man was walking upright. And then all of a sudden they developed fire and fire was a thing they found and they learned how to, they learned how to capture it and they learned how to use it and they learned how to use it for their own benefit and all of this. And, and the question is always, well, how did they learn how to make it? So they, they captured it from a forest fire. Okay. Well, that's a lightning bolt that hits a tree and explodes it. And then there's fire. So then someone decided, oh, well, when you chip a flint and a steel together. Well, but they didn't have steel. <laughs> and you can, you, can, you can explain it away. But the much simpler explanation is, well, someone taught them. Well, and as we've learned, ideas are spiritual, mm -hmm. and the ways to convey ideas is spirit to spirit. Right. So, and and that's what she dives into here. Uh, she pulls out a passage from Isaiah. Oh, and Crystal actually brought her Bible. I did. Look at you. He's talking about himself being the cornerstone of Zion. And then it says, give ear. And hear my voice, give attention, hear my speech. Why does he do this? Why does he do this at the right time? For he is rightly instructed. His God teaches him. Why does he know how to thresh? How to beat one thing and not thresh the other? This also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. So she goes on, she says, in the things of science, in the things of art, in the things of practical everyday life, his God doth instruct him and doth teach him. Her God doth instruct her and doth teach her. And she says, let this be the mother's key to the whole of education of each boy and each girl, not of her children, not grouped together, the group of children, no, no, each, each single child. Because he is infinite, because God is infinite, the whole world is not too great a school for this indefatigable teacher. In wow, indefagable. that's indefatigable. 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 Indef and I indefatigable. I did look it up. I know you did. You pronounced it correctly, because I looked it up too. <laughs> so, but because he's infinite, he's able to give the whole of his infinite attention for the whole time. To each one of his multitudinous pupils. Which I cannot do. No. We have five children. Each of those five children requires a lot of time. They know how to wait. Or are learning how to wait. Some of them better than others. Mm -hmm. Honestly, the twins better than others. Our twin two-year-olds know how to wait better than some of our other children. At times. Sometimes. At times. It's kind of funny. Well, they've always had to wait on each other. From, from you know, birth, they've been waiting for somebody else. The way that they've learned how to take turns is awesome. But yeah, you don't have the time to devote to each child. 
And even if we only had one child, you still wouldn't have the time to devote to that one child's education. Mm -hmm. It still wouldn't be enough. Which is why he is the divine teacher. And and that's the great recognition that coming back to this is a tantamount belief and something you cannot you cannot educate without to have a full robust education. Right. You you have to combine the religious and the secular, put all of it under one head, and the divine spirit, the Holy Spirit, is at that head. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Which, I don't know. It's, it's very – it holds a lot of gravity. It does. Well, and she goes on to give a list here. She says what subjects are under the direction because you just said you need to hold it all under under that head. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So she's going to get specific here. She says what subject? She says, well, clearly the child's faith, hope, and charity, faith, hope, and love, that we knew. Well, that's always been under the purveyance of the church. Right. So that's fine. Temperance, justice, prudence, fortitude. Okay, we'll go with that. Sure, that's still mostly under the church. It's mostly under the church. You can claim it's not, but it, it works still. Then she says his grammar, his rhetoric, logic, music, astronomy, geometry, arithmetic. This we might have forgotten if those Florentine teachers had not reminded us. His practical skills in the use of tools and instruments, from a knife and a fork to a microscope, and in the sensible management of all the affairs of his life. These also come from the Lord, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. So, everything. You need a curriculum list? What subjects to teach? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, I guess it's right there. <laughs> well, and it includes character development, mm -hmm. faith, hope, charity, temperance, justice, prudence, fortitude, and practical skills, the tools and instruments, mm -hmm. and sensible management. And academics. Grammar, rhetoric, logic, music, or astronomy, geometry, or arithmetic. And if if you're in a situation where your child has to be educated in a different way, if, you, if your situation is you have to put them in public school or in private school or do something other than a Charlotte Mason method, these still need to be taught. Mm -hmm. And the question is, where are they being taught and how are they being taught those extra extra uh academic extracurricular Curricular. skills yeah. and character well it's something we talked about as we were as we were opening this up we we're talking about how us having read or me having read her philosophy allows me to implement her philosophy regardless of whether we're following her actual method or not mm -hmm. so like you said whether your child is in what, whether you are strictly following the P, PNEU method and using only exactly what Charlotte Mason said or complete on the other side of the spectrum, your children are in the most secular public school system there is, you can still follow her, her philosophy in instructing your children. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to be more or less difficult depending on where your child is being educated. And because you only have 24 hours in a day. And that. And a lot of them should be sleeping. And especially for children. Yeah. I mean, children need to sleep a solid 10 to 12 hours a day. Children should sleep a solid. I'm not going to say need to because clearly a lot of children get away with sleeping a lot less than that. Children talking ideals sleep, here. <laughs> right? Speaking speaking in ideals. And and that's what we speak as we've been going through this book, we've been speaking in ideals. The ideal situation is for the child to stay home with mom and dad and work and study and learn and all of these things. That's the ideal. And so we've talked about whatever you can do to move yourself closer to that ideal from wherever from wherever you're at. Mm-hmm. So does that mean that you you just you sit down and read one living book a day with your child or or a week and that's what you do to step closer to that ideal then that's great you're stepping to that ideal what whatever you can do to get closer is is good and right Mhm mm So anyway subject list There it is 
His God doth instruct him and doth teach him. And let the mother visualize this as even over newborns. Mm -hmm. And never contemplate that any kind of instruction for the child except under the sense of the divine cooperation. Right. So then she has a caveat on this as well. This infinite and almighty spirit of God works under limitations. So he is not limited, but there are limitations to what he does. Mm -hmm. And that appears to be our cooperation. Yeah, she says our cooperation appears to be indispensable, appears to be the indispensable condition of all the divine workings. The new thing for us and in, in, in dealing with this recognition, the new thing is saying that grammar can be taught in such a way as to invite and obtain cooperation from the divine teacher or in a way that excludes him from the schoolroom and right. his illuminating presence. And not just that the teacher is upright and virtuous and thereby the child sees that while they're doing grammar. Yes, that's true. But the point is not that the the point is not that it is external to grammar. It is grammar. Right. That the the syntax and and grammar is in itself an inspiring idea because it was created and is under the divine influence. Gotcha. So we can either invite and obtain cooperation, or we can teach so that it shuts it down. Where we can enwrap the child's mind in folds of many words so he can't think about it and penetrate it, or the too many rules and definitions of table in lieu of ideas. Mm -hmm. And this teaching excludes and renders impossible the divine cooperation. And I think that's because, again, ideas are spiritual and ideas spark learning. Yes. <laughs> but if it's just rules and definitions without their um, supporting idea, mm -hmm. if it's just do this because, then there's there, there's less way to be inspired by that. Right. Well, she she goes on. She talks about that. She she has another aside here, but she she definitely gets back to talking about talking about the that the teaching must be fresh and living. That goes into the house, so we'll get there. Right, we'll we'll get there. But I I wanted to I wanted to mention that she does talk about. She says that this right here. She she gives a don't do this, but do this. But she gets into it a little more in depth here in a couple more pages. But she definitely takes kind of a kind of a hard left turn here. Because we've been going on a pretty steady path of education and it's from the spirit and now we as parents need to partner with the spirit and we need to teach our children. And then all of a sudden she kind of takes a hard left turn and she talks about discord in our lives and we have to resolve this. And she says, the great, this great recognition resolves that discord in our lives of which most of us are more or less aware. I, I wouldn't say this is so much of a hard left turn as it is. It, kind of a parallel track. Yeah, maybe maybe just an aside. Because because you know you think of a roll track and you've got just the little out out thing. It's you know this this discord between the sacred and the secular is alive and well in our lives. Right. In that, if it's God, God is with religion, the education and. Uh, academics is with secular. And when those two are opposing each other, who do you choose? Right. She, she says here, and if all the burning thoughts that stir in the minds of men, all the beautiful conceptions they give birth to are things apart from God, then we too must have a separate life, a life apart from God, a division of ourselves into secular and religious mm -hmm. discord and unrest. And and if we're split in that way, then how on earth are we going to live? And the young man or woman, full of promise or power, becomes a free thinker or ag agnostic mm -hmm. because they choose to go with the claims of the intellect. Mm -hmm. But once the intimate relation, the relation of teacher, and that's a capital T, so 
of the Holy Spirit, and taught in all the things of mind and spirit be fully recognized, our feet are set in a large room. There is space for free development in all direction. And this is a free and joyous development, whether of intellect or heart, is recognized as a Godward movement. Mm -hmm. So all things can move us towards God. And it's freeing once we know that there is a a final say-so, a final authority over all things. Right. Within those bounds, we are free. Mm -hmm. Well, and not only that, no longer are we split between, well, is this spiritual or secular? Do I need to, do I need to worry about where God is in this or not? Do I need to worry if this is from the spirit or not? Mm -hmm. And and so you're no longer, you're no longer split in that. Yep. So I, I think it's, it's more of an aside than a rabbit trail. Because she was talking about how it is in education, and then she's talking about how it is in a person. No, that makes sense. Which means also we can sin intellectually as well as we can sin morally. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, more ways to sin. <laughs> <laughs> just, just what we all needed. More ways to screw up. As if we're not all screw up enough, screw ups enough, whatever, already. Here we find more ways to do it. But it also brings unity of aim, harmony, and peace into our lives. Yeah. So she moves, she, she talks about that, and then she brings it into the harmony in our efforts. She says, what stands between us and the realization of this more blessed life? So I have the entire sentence before you, that question underlined. I, I was trying to figure <laughs> out where to come into this because I have the rest of that section highlighted. <laughs> like the... So between the two of us, we have almost the whole right? thing highlighted. Basically the whole thing. She says, such a recognition of the work of the Holy Spirit as the educator of mankind in things both intellectual and moral and spiritual gives us new thoughts of God, new hopes of heaven, a sense of harmony in our efforts and of acceptance of all that we are. Well, and what stands between us and the realization of this more blessed life? This, that we do not realize ourselves as spiritual beings invested with bodies, Ah, uh, cart or horse comes first. Right. Are we spiritual beings living with bodies or are we bodies that also have a spirit? Mm -hmm. And she says, once we see that we're dealing with, we're dealing spirit with spirit, then we shall be able to realize how incessant is the commerce between the divine spirit and our human spirit. Once we realize that, that ideas flow from spirit to spirit, then all of a sudden we realize that we're on a different plane with the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God communicates us with us spirit to spirit, because we are spiritual beings in in physical bodies. I wonder if that's another reason why Jesus said it was better for him to go. I could believe it. So that there was no extra encumbrance of a physical body. That would make sense. Uh, on top of, you know, all the other reasons. I mean, there's a myriad, but that's that's definitely probably a good one. Well, and once we pause to be able to listen spirit to spirit with even somebody beside us, it opens our ears to how to listen to the spirit mm -hmm. of God. When she says we're not speaking here of what's commonly called the religious life, prayer and praise and church stuff. We're not talking about church stuff. That's a that's a different ball game. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the intellectual life, the development of which in children is the aim of our subjects and methods of instruction. And back to academics. And, yep. So the tracks split and, and now we're right back. So basically, we're going moving into your the how section, the imperative section. Yes. Assuming we're willing to make this great recognition. To engage ourselves, to accept and invite this daily, hourly, incessant cooperation of the Divine Spirit in, to put it definitely plainly, in the schoolroom work of our children. How must we shape our own conduct to make this cooperation active or even possible? Yeah, she says, we're told that the Spirit is life. Therefore, that which is dead, dry as dust, mere bare bones can have no affinity with him. It can do no it can do no other than smother and deaden his vitalizing influences. She says, all that we offer to our children shall be living thought, 
No more dry summaries of facts will do. One thing that I do remember from school is trying to memorize dates and names and places. And she talks about that in a minute here. But those are those are dry facts. And she says once that the child has that vitalizing idea, then the facts can go on to that mm -hmm. as a as a peg capable of sustaining everything it needs to retain. Right. So once you have the idea, then you can put those facts on and it will be applicable. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely true. Once, once you're excited about a thing, you learn all kinds of stuff about it. If you're excited about, if, if you're excited about, oh, I don't know, the American revolution or the Scottish revolution or anything else. We can list off revolutions. <laughs> we could list off a lot of revolutions. No, I mean, the one I was thinking was I, I read, I read uh, when I was in, in high school, I read a book about Robert the Bruce and, and uh, William Wallace by extension. But I, at the, at the time, the, the book was very dry and I didn't, I didn't gain anything from it. Years later, I watched the movie Braveheart. Very, very historically inaccurate, but the the <laughs> movie the movie sparked in me a desire to to learn more about it. It's like, oh man, this great William Wallace guy and all the cool stuff he did. And so I went and I, I I looked into it, and of my own volition, I looked and learned dates and names and places and things. And I don't remember them all today, but but it was fascinating to look into it and learn how wrong the movie was. Hmm. But the movie, the work of art, inspired the idea to learn about it. And maybe that's a bad example because the movie was not historically accurate. But it inspired me to go learn. So, I don't know. Well, and then you've got things like Downton Abbey. Mm -hmm. Where y you have people who are extremely concerned with historical accuracy mm -hmm. in, in minute details. I have not watched it. I don't really like that type of period piece but i've read a couple articles about how particular they are mm -hmm. about every little detail yeah and that has inspired many 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 people maybe maybe to look into what it was like then or maybe just to watch the the series visual media media can be very inspiring mm -hmm. I, one and one of the reasons i think is because it's just by nature of of a a movie or a TV show, it is alive. That you're watching people do things. Now that doesn't mean it's living, quote unquote, in the same way that that Charlotte Mason talks about living material, but it's the written word doesn't stand up and act and move and talk. Mm -hmm. a, a, an audio visual thing does. Yeah. Which is why one of our daughters has a lot of issues with the audiovisual. Yeah. And she's fine with books and she's mm -hmm. fine with, honestly, some rather horrific things happening in books. And she really doesn't bat an eye. But if this was a couple of years back, but if Winnie the Pooh gets stuck in the hole when he's trying to get out of Rabbit's house. Because he ate too much honey and he got too fat. She loses it. Yeah. Lost it. At that time, she lost it because she could see his distress and his mm -hmm. stuckness and that sent her over the edge. Yeah. But if she, if, when we read about it, it was fine. Yeah. But so it's, it's interesting. It is. So then moving on to how the teaching should be. So if we know we should offer our children living thought, not summaries of facts then we should allow them to have a fresh and living way of approaching it. Allow them to travel with the explorer, um, receive the impressions new and vivid from that mind who is also immediately receiving that. So journals and mm -hmm. firsthand descriptions, not after they've been processed and filtered and found their way into a textbook. Same with history. Are we doing dates and times and names or little easy stories? Or are we doing 
you know, the, the massive ones, in this case, Plutarch. I didn't even know who Plutarch was until I started <laughs> learning about Charlotte Mason. And she says a child of seven is able to fully understand mm -hmm. it. And I think that's at their own level. But at the same time, they can get ideas from there. And she talked in the past about, you know, the idea of the little duke who, when he got up, he got up. Mm -hmm. And that was what this child decided to do. Mm -hmm. So give him living thought of this kind and you make possible the cooperation of the living teacher. And she, she goes on here. She says, it's unnecessary to go further into detail. Every subject has its own living way with what Coleridge calls its guiding idea at the head. But there's no neat system. It's the very nature of a system to grow stale in the using. So if we, if we try and stick to a strict system, read this, then this, then this, only read that, read one chapter of this and then stop instantly, then it's going to get stale. It's going to be stale, I think. It seems like what she's saying. <laughs> Which is rough because systems are nice. They systems are. are predictable. Systems are easily implementable across the wide variety of people. They are. But she talked about system as compared to method. Oh, that was way back when. When was that? Four? I wish I had a search function. You could pull it up. Nah. Is it discipline? Come on, John. You gotta look these It was. Up. It was discipline. It was uh, 16. It was in chapter 16, uh, which is talking about discipline. And she starts out that chapter and she says, uh, she answers the question first. Well, she answers the question, what part does discipline play in your system of education? She says, well, hold that thought. <laughs> Let's talk about what a system of education is first. And she says, we don't have a system. We have a method. A system is an infinity of rules and instructions. A method follows nature humbly, and it stands aside and gives her fair play. And she goes to great lengths about this. And I think, so I, I think she spent like half of the chapter on it. She did. It was it was pretty impressive. She legitimately cared about this, and so that's where she's saying this. There's no neat. There's no neat system. You can't do it. You must follow a method. You have to follow nature. You have to allow the child to wander and think and learn. And, and you you can't just say, "Well, here are the rules. Stick to them. The child will learn." And any subject that you teach needs to be brought to the light of is, are we working under a system or are we working under a method? Right. Are we working in a way to invite the living intellect of the universe or are we working in a way that stifles it? Yeah. And what we need to do, one more thing, is of vital importance. Well, hold on. If you're if you didn't listen to it, go back and listen to that was episode thirty eight was our discussion on chapter sixteen. So if you didn't listen to it and you're hearing us talk about how Charlotte Mason talked about this, then go back and listen to that chapter for a minute. It, it'll be interesting, at least the first half of it, and then come back and pick this up. Let's continue. Sorry, you stopped me. I did. I'm pimping our own show. <laughs> <laughs> but you stop me that the thing of vital importance. Yeah, pimping our own show. Children must have books. Living books. The best are not too good for children. And anything less than the best is not good enough. What I think is interesting here is that she goes into a little bit of economic thought. If it is needful to exercise economy, there you go. That's what I'll say whenever I'm being frugal or thrifty. <laughs> I am exercising economy. <laughs> <laughs> By buying lots of books at a used book sale? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she says, uh, let go everything that belongs to soft and luxurious living. 
before letting go the duty of supplying the books and the frequent changes of books, which are necessary for the constant stimulation of the child's intellectual life. We need not say one word about the necessity for living thought in the teacher. It is only so far as he is intellectually alive that he can be effective in the wonderful process which we glibly call education. So you, you think back to the Abraham Lincolns, the, well, that's the only one I can think of right now, where he's, you know, in his lo little log cabin and all he has are the, uh, two books to read. But that's because that's all his family can afford. Mm -hmm. And they do provide him with those two books and the means of reading them. Yeah. And the ideas that are inspired by uh, good books change the world. They absolutely do. And if you look back through history at those people who have been most influential, for good or bad, they have been influenced by books. And the ideas contained in said books. Right. And I say good or bad because even... even the most brutal and evil of people were inspired by someone's writings. So find good books. And provide them. And read them. And read them for yourself. Because the teacher needs to be intellectually alive as well. Yeah. Well, and you have to be able to have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. So that when the child asks a question or starts talking about a thing... That you can that you can engage with that conversation. So there are the the question comes up not infrequently about, you know, I never had this type of education. How am I supposed to provide this for my child when I don't know what I'm doing or talking about? Hmm. And one of the suggestions is to go one year ahead in whatever curriculum you've chosen, and you do that year alongside your child doing the, the year below. And that way you're one year ahead, but you're also educating yourself at the same time. Interesting. So just a little tidbit. No, that would, that's, that's very interesting. Because that way, one, you know what's coming. Mm -hmm. Two, you've read all the books, so you're educating yourself as you go. Especially if, if your education was lacking. So There you go. Good books. That's what it all comes back to. <laughs> as we look at this library that crystal has procured it makes me happy thank you for listening join the conversation with us on instagram facebook or twitter